Hi there, I'm Fred Trost, and I'm here with Jim Bedford, a member of the Michigan Salmon and Steelhead Fishermen's Association. And Jim, you're known for catching an awful lot of this kind of fish all year long, well, especially in the fall, winter, and spring. In fact, you probably caught this one not too long ago, eh? Yeah, this was caught a couple weeks ago, a steelhead trout. How many of these have you caught? Well, I'm up close to 700 now, Fred. 700 steelhead trout. You're going to hear all about it in just a minute because it's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Michigan. Both of these fish are the same species. Of course, this is a mounted specimen that Ned Fogel from the DNR's Fisheries Division is holding, and this one is one you just took out of the Grand River at 6th Street Dam at Grand Rapids, uh, Jim. But they look quite a bit different. A lot of fishermen might think that this would be a salmon, maybe. What happened to the rainbow that's supposed to be down the side of our rainbow steelhead trout? Many of our uh, steelhead do not have that. They're generally out in the Great Lakes, they're very silvery. They do not have the color until they move in the stream and start developing their spawning colors. The, the steelhead are an interesting fish in that they come in in the fall, or generally in the spring, but some of them in the fall, so they can spawn in the spring, right? So you're catching them on right. their spawning runs. Right. But fish are not supposed to eat on their spawning runs. I've heard that steelhead trout don't even take a bit of food from the time they leave the Great Lakes, and it might be all winter long. No, this is very common to migratory species that come in spawning like this, of these uh, of the trout. They'll come in, and they don't eat a thing the minute they enter the stream. Okay, I, got, I have two questions on that. Number one, how can they do it? How can they last for four or five months without food? Fish, the makeup of their body and that, they live on their body fat, and they just continually lose weight. But there's many animals that do this, like in hibernation. They can get by by living on their fat, and fish do this. So you, you, but the second question comes to mind, Jim. You're a spinner fisherman, one of the best spinner fishermen in the state. You use this little lure that a lot of people would think looks like a minnow spinning in the water. Why would this fish hit something that looks like a minnow if it isn't eating? Well, it's, it's mainly hitting it out of aggravation. You've sort of excited it into hitting. It's, it's out in the big lake. It's been chasing silvery bait fish, and while it's not actively feeding now, it still sort of triggers a response back in its brain, and it uh, lashes out of the flashy lure. And it'll do this from fall, winter, right through to right. the spring. Yes. Yeah. You have to remember also that the water is very cold in the wintertime, so they don't really need a lot of food. To... So they don't move that much. No. Okay. Well, wh what would happen if a minnow went cruising by? Would it Chase after I think it? I would probably ignore it. I rarely ever find anything in the stomachs of these steelhead. So maybe something about the lure spinning through the water. But fishermen catch steelhead on spawn well, in the winter. Uh, it's still a striking reaction, generally. They'll take it as it comes through, because yeah. generally your spawn is bright colored. Quite often fishermen will put a spinner or something with it, or little colored baits along with it. But these know. fish are almost never found all winter long with anything in their stomachs right. when you catch right. one. Right. Right. An interesting fish, the steelhead trout. What's the state record? Do you know, Ned? It's just a little over 26 pounds. 26 pounds. That's probably close to a 20-pounder yeah, right pretty now. Pretty close. Mm -hmm. Well, Jim, you've uh, cut this one open and uh, have it ready to eat. I wish that some of you folks out there who I hear about a little too late, you already cut them up and fillet them for dinner and cook them, and we don't get to hear about them here in Michigan Outdoors. But if you catch a fish you're proud of, a trophy fish of any type, Give us a call so we can put you right here where Jim Bedford is, and we'll have Ned Fogel give some commentary, too. Well, thanks a lot for coming down, Jim. And now we're going to talk about a fish, a walleye, that uh, Ed Groves has some news on that is going to be expanded now in southern Michigan. That's right, Fred, and the DNR has found an economical way of doing it. This is an abandoned sewage treatment pond at Jackson Prison. It doesn't look like much, but next July, 200,000 walleye fingerlings will be produced from this site. The Grand River flows nearby, and the water will be diverted to flood the 20-acre walleye rearing pond. Excavation of the site, including the waterway from the Grand to the pond, has been going on all summer. Most of the 200,000 walleye will be planted next summer in southern Michigan lakes, where no walleye are currently found, and that's good news to fishermen. But even better news to taxpayers and fishing license buyers is that this $100,000 project is only costing $11,000 at the state prison because it's using the abandoned pond, an effective use of state land, state facilities, and sportsman's money by the DNR. Well, we started this year's deer season with about 1,250,000 deer. If hunters took 150,000, as the DNR predicted, along with another 25 or 30,000 during the bow season, Michigan still has over a million deer that have to face the winter. With each doe capable of producing one or two fawns, the herd has the capability of approaching two million by the summer. 
that is if they all survive the winter and all their fawns survive. But we know that won't happen. It never does and never has. There's not enough food during the middle of winter in many northern areas to keep that many deer healthy. Some die, many become weak, fawns are stillborn or unhealthy. It's not a pretty sight, but the, de but the deer herd just can't grow to match its reproductive potential because of the bottleneck in the food supply in January and February. That's why the 180,000 deer taken by hunters won't affect the growth of the deer herd. Five million pounds of venison were put into freezers by hunters this deer season, meat that can be used. But what about the million plus deer that are left? the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of crop damage they'll cause, the 20 or 30,000 car deer accidents they become involved in next year, and the bottleneck of 750,000 hunters that will crowd themselves into Michigan's two-week hunting season in November. Well, the executive director of the Michigan United Conservation Clubs, Tom Washington, says he has a solution to this problem, which is why Fred has him on our Michigan Outdoors hot seat right now. Tom? You have what some people are going to say is a far out solution to this to spread out the hunters. Go ahead, tell us what it is. Well, Fred, you know that uh, people are always uh, opposed, or uh, some people are opposed to, to breaking what has become tradition. November 15th. And, and our state, uh, November 15th, is opening of the firearm season, is almost carved in stone. Uh, there have been some minor variances of that over the years, but very few, and it's been pretty much that way. We have a chart here that. Uh, uh, shows uh, just one suggestion of, of what we could do. Uh, the top line shows the traditional seasons, October 1st uh, to November 15th for bow and arrow, November 15th to December 1 firearms, and then back into our bow and arrow season to finish out the year. Uh, we could break that up in this fashion. Uh, as an example, we could have ourselves uh, one month of bow season, 15 days of deer firearm season, 15 more days of bow season, 15 more of firearm season, and uh, finish it off with the uh, bow and arrow. But I think there are several alternatives to this, this proposal. But why do you want to break it up like that? Well, for several reasons. First of all, we're thoroughly convinced that we're not taking enough deer, that we could, could take a lot more deer in the state. We could provide a lot more recreational opportunity for deer hunters, as well as a lot more meat and uh, a lot more dollars to our tourist economy. That's one of the reasons. The second reason is, is that we are jamming uh, about 800,000 people uh, into the woods uh, for the opening of the firearms deer season, and very frankly, that's just too many. It hasn't really become a serious safety problem, but it has become a serious problem in terms of trespass, in terms of uh, sportsmanship, in terms of littering, and uh, a lot of other unsavory aspects uh, that uh, give the sportsman a black eye. How would, uh, you, could everybody hunt both seasons or what? Well, I think what we really need is uh, some discretionary authority for the Natural Resources Commission to experiment for about five years uh, with some variations of this kind of a proposal. Let's, let's uh, see what's best for us. It may very well be that we need staggered seasons in different parts of the state. It may be that we can offer additional tags to hunters that uh, get their deer early and want to go out and hunt more. Uh, it may be that we uh, have to insist that uh, second and third deer or more uh, have to be antlerless deer. Uh, but right now, our seasons are, are very inflexible, and uh, we believe that uh, we, we need an opportunity to experiment and to provide all of these things that I've mentioned. And of course, a precedent has been set in many other states. For example, New Mexico here, their elk seasons are five-day seasons that are broken up, and you apply for a permit in one of these seasons and that seems to be working well out west. It's worked very well in a great many states, and uh, unfortunately, our, uh, our wildlife division, and, uh, and uh, of course, controlled by our legislature, uh, has been uh, ultra-conservative in the setting of seasons and bag limits and so forth. Uh, really, those things should be done based on the best scientific uh, evidence that's available as close to the season as possible and done by the Natural Resources Commission after input from the biologists. What reaction do you expect sportsmen will have to this? Is probably <coughs> MUCC will be introducing these ideas this year? Well, we're going to be discussing them in our game committees and, uh, and bringing proposals uh, before our, our uh, governing body. Uh, there will be some sportsmen that just will think that this is the end of the world as far as, uh, mm -hmm. as hunting goes. But uh, really, I think that uh, most of our hunters are going to welcome these proposals with open arms. Uh, most of the fellows uh, and the ladies, I might add, that, that like to hunt uh, are going to get an increased opportunity to be in the field, and they're going to get an increased opportunity to take game and, and more of it. 
Well, that's Tom Washington's idea. What do you think? Do you have an opinion on this? You like the idea of split seasons, experimenting with seasons? Why don't you write us a letter here at Michigan Outdoors and tell us what you think. That's Box 1, East Lansing, 48823. Let us know what you think about Tom Washington's proposal. Well, thank you, Tom. We'll be interested to follow that one. Now let's go over and take a wildlife sketch and an animal that's a winter resident from the Arctic. We don't have the live specimen here, but we do have what's called a study skin in the able hands of Glenn Dutterer. Glenn, you're the Extension Wildlife Specialist here at Michigan State University. You know about a lot of different critters that come down to Michigan here uh, in the winter, and one of them is this critter right here. What is it? This is a snowy owl, sometimes called an Arctic owl, and a frequent visitor to Michigan in the wintertime. But they don't live here during the summer, do they? Oh, no, no. These birds live really year-round in the Arctic area, in the Arctic Circle, in the tundra, er tundra area of Canada. But when their food supply runs short, they move south. To keep warmer and to find more food. Well, let's talk about the, the snowy owl that we had here at Michigan State University on top of this building right here where we do the program where WKAR is located. This snowy owl was here, oh, it still is around campus, isn't it? Yes, it is. This was uh, shot oh, about a month or six weeks ago. What is it that a snowy owl finds to eat down here? Well, a little bit of everything. It'll take uh, ground squirrels, chipmunks, tree squirrels, uh, a pheasant or a grouse if it can pick one off, any small bird or mammal that it's capable of taking. Now, this owl is eating right in the middle of the day. Yes. I thought owls were nocturnal, nighttime creatures. Well, the owls that we're familiar with in Michigan are, but remember this snowy owl lives in a region where for six months of the time it's daylight, close to 24 hours or 24 hours a day. So it is, mm. has to be able to hunt both in the day and in the night. And so it can hunt during the daytime. It's quite a proficient diurnal hunter, a daytime hunter. You know, you would think that an owl like this that comes down from Alaska or somewhere in the far northern lands wouldn't want to be around people. Well, it doesn't recognize people. Remember, this is from the far north, and I don't think it realizes what people are or realizes the danger that people can pose for a wild animal. That is amazing. They, so they, they'll fly around during the day? Yes, and hunt during the day. How uh, many of them would be in Michigan right now? Oh, that's hard to say, uh, maybe a couple of hundred. But you see, this will vary. Uh, a few each year drift south for reasons I'm not really sure anyone knows. But then when lemming populations decline very precipitously, very quickly as they do in the north, then literally hundreds will come south uh, from anywhere from Michigan to as far south as Texas. So these snowy owls eat lemmings? Yes, in the that's Arctic? their prime food in the, in the Arctic, yes. The so they come down here to Michigan. Uh, this is a, a warm vacation for them, a place <laughs> to find a lot of food. And we have a lot of other birds that go south because they've run out of food. Right, this is south for a lot of birds, and Arctic owl being one of them. Does the Arctic owl uh, have any dangers? Well, yes. Uh, remember, it's in a strange environment. And most of them that drift south probably don't make it back north because other predatory birds will occasionally kill these snowy owls, such as a red-tailed hawk or a fox. Remember, they sit on the ground mm -hmm. because they live in a treeless region. Do you think that the owl right there perched by Spartan Stadium uh, is maybe waiting for a wolverine? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> wow. Well, I... As a Spartan. <laughs> don't want to get too political here. Or... <laughs> but. But these owls, you say, might be taken by a red-tailed hawk? That sure, is remember, incredible. this white owl sitting on a grassy hummock in the middle of a field would be a prime target for a rough-legged hawk or a red-tailed hawk here in the I didn't know that Michigan. those predatory birds ate each other. Sure, some owls eat other owls. It's not uncommon for a great horned owl, the big hoot owl of Michigan, to take the little tiny screech owl from time to time. Okay, the more you learn about wildlife, they look so pretty and look so cute, all of these uh, animals, but uh, it's a dog eat dog owl eat owl world out sure. there. Sure. Well, Glenn, thanks an awful lot Thank for sharing for that with us. I hope you'll come My back pleasure. and talk about some more Michigan wildlife. Stan Levensee, it's time to do back to basics here. And for a lot of people who want to get into ice fishing, no better man to talk to than Stan Levensee, Mr. Michigan Fishing. Stan, I'm going to get into your uh, tackle box here for your winter, your ice fishing sled. We have <coughs> what's called a sneaky bobber here with your Little right. monofilament thread or this type of rig with a spring a, bobber on here, this one, and a, a bobber technique here. Okay, well, this somebody could get a rod like this and maybe an ice spud like we have right here, wouldn't cost too much. And uh, why don't you give us some lessons on how to use them? Well, of course, the one of the uh, first essentials is getting a hole through the ice, and probably the 
Most use is the ice bud. They're the most uh, economical to purchase. Uh, they are a lot of work, but mm -hmm. they get you through, uh, especially as the winter goes on. They get uh, the ice gets thicker and thicker. But uh, for a guy it, who wants to spend uh, eight or ten bucks to get through the ice, this will do the job. It'll do the job and get you through the whole winter. Then, of course, you want a, a scoop to get the ice out so that you're not bothered with all the mm -hmm. uh, ice cubes floating around in your uh, uh, hole. Of course, now, if a guy uses a spud maybe two or three times, he's going to automatically think of something else, maybe one of those fancy augers. Things have been getting easier for the fishermen. We've got imports from uh, the Scandinavian countries, such as this uh, auger here. Uh, this is a step in a, a much easier direction. The that difficulty keeps with, don't you? The difficulty with this type is they, they do get dull with uh, a little usage, and you have to learn how to sharpen them. But they do well, give a nice uniform hole. Right. But now we're coming to the one that I think is uh, by far the best, and of course the price is going up. Mm -hmm. But this, in maybe the $30 range with this. Right. This will uh, work a lot easier, and uh, you can get through the uh, uh, ice in a much uh, quicker fashion with this. You get those in about a four or a, a six inch size. And uh, the six inch works a little more difficult than the four. And those are basically the three manual methods of boring a hole in the ice. And they're most important, too, because uh, a good ice fisherman will want to make a lot of holes and, and search around to try to find where the fish are biting most actively. And uh, so the auger that you use is, is very important, or the spud. Now, here, of course, is the, uh, the deluxe of all, oh, yeah. the, the power auger. And for the serious fisherman that does a lot of fishing, a lot of exploring, uh, this will really pay off. Uh, it's always nice when you got to fill in the party with one of these uh, oh, power augers. I'll say, <laughs> out on Saginaw Bay towards the end of the winter, ooh, that ice gets thick. We're talking a couple of feet. Yeah. But for the guy who's fishing, uh, you know, and you buy one of those little ice fishing kits that has the rod and the reel and also has one of these weights in it. Fortunately, you can buy a, a very cheap outfit and be fishing. And with the price of uh, meat the way it is today, uh, perch, for instance, is about eight dollars per pound. Uh, this is a good winter to go, but first of all, of course, you want to wait on to uh, find bottom. It's good to establish bottom and then generally start your fishing about a foot off the bottom. And then if the fishing is slow, you may have to work up a little bit. Uh, but here we got a fish on. Uh, no, not right here. Oh, no, this is pulling up the, uh, the sinker. Right. Okay. That's right. So you found how deep the water is. Yeah. Next thing to do is to get your lure down there to entice the fish to now bite. I got a little ice jig which we're going to sweeten up with a, a grub. There's either the wax worms or the mousies or the corn bores and so forth. That can Nobody be used. uses night crawlers or not during the winter. Why these, not? These grubs work so fine. Actually, you want to realize the metabolism has really slowed those fish down. Their appetite is practically nil, so you go with little tidbits. And a grub just kind of fits that, uh, that appetite. Of course, a lot of people sell these and store them in the refrigerator in containers like that much to the chagrin of wives and kids who are rummaging through the refrigerator looking for a snack. One of the urgent things here to comment, Fred, is once you get it down, it's a good idea to keep working it. You can't have a bait just sitting there and expect much action. Now, we happen to be fishing a deep lake, as you'll know here, and you'll notice, too, that the monofilament is very light. Uh, it pays to go down to uh, at least four pound test and as the winter progresses you'll go down to a two pound test line perhaps and finally even down to a one pound test well, that thread by late you can February. Buy. That's Not a right. filament thread. That's right. Works fine. But this is the biggest mistake ice fishermen uh, make is using a line a little too heavy. Now late in the winter you use this spring bobber is, is a, a very sensitive way of seeing that you have a bite. Uh, if you didn't have something like this, there's times with a bobber, if you use a bobber, that you may not even, mm -hmm. it may not even register a bite. So what is the advantage of a bobber like this? The, the bobber is a lot, a lot of fun. You know, we started out with kids fishing mm -hmm. bobbers, and uh, oh, it's fun. As long as early in the season, it works very good, the fish bite good, and, but uh, later on, they feel the resistance of a bobber, and uh, you miss a lot of fish. What about keeping warm on the ice? Well, this is a big essential. You notice I have uh, rubber footwear. I also have a raincoat, which uh, stops the wind. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is very, very good. Lots the, of long underwear. Lots of long underwear. We've got the little uh, lantern there, which gives a, a little heat. And then uh, sitting on something to keep off the ice uh, helps. And uh, I'm perfectly comfortable. And uh, uh, keeping warm is a big part of ice fishing, because otherwise you just don't pay attention. And that lantern, of course, comes in handy when it gets a little dark and you want to see, but mainly fishermen use that to keep warm. 
and keep your hands warm. That's most important. Now, ice fishing shanties are, are one way to go, but you can also park a car out on the ice if the ice is thick enough. You don't want to try that this weekend. No, they are out there, uh, but uh, as you say, it's too early for this weekend with a car. Or even a snowmobile, as far as that goes. For sure. But now we're up on a lake where you're going to show us, Stan, how you actually catch a fish. Now, when you use a bobber like this, one disadvantage is if you have your depth set, you really can't reel it in. You can't reel it in. Generally, with bluegills, you don't reel it in anyway. You will uh, do differently than I'm going to do here. I'm hand over handing that one because we're in uh, Crystal Lake up in Montcalm County, where it's pretty deep. Mm -hmm. But ordinarily, you'd slide the line with the use the rod tip, you know, and keep the spring of the rod. And of course, that's not a particularly challenging bluegill, but uh, you can get some of those big nine, ten inches, and then you need that rod tip to cushion the shock on your two-pound test monofilament. That wasn't a challenging bluegill. It took long enough to catch it, as I recall, <laughs> when we went out and filmed it. Well, Stan, thanks a lot for those basics. I'm going to do a little basics here, if you'll bear with me, on uh, cleaning a steelhead trout. Uh, somebody might catch a fish this size through the ice, mightn't he, this winter? Very possible, especially yeah. in Great Lakes waters. And that won't be freezing up for some time. First thing to do when you fillet a fish is you want to have a good sharp knife, use it on a whetstone, and then a steel. I like to use a steel. It takes uh, two or three passes over that, and it takes a little burr off of the edge of the knife, and you're ready to go. Now, Stan, as I fillet this fish, I happen to know that you are probably Michigan's premier fisherman. You've caught more fish, but you know more about more types of fishing, but I wouldn't actually call you a gourmet, would you? Well, I'm trying to be, Fred. With your fine cooking, I think I might make it. But that is interesting to me that you, uh, you love to fish so much, but uh, eating fish is not really your forte? Well, I think the, uh, my desire is, I, I like a, uh, a hard fried fish rather than a soft fish. Like, th this would be probably, uh, well, how would you fix it? Uh, well, I'm sure I'm gonna fillet it here. What I've uh, done is I've cut down to the ribs, just bind the backbone, and when I get down to the end of the ribs, you can feel where it is with the knife tip. You cut all the way through and right along the top of the backbone right down to the tail, but I don't like to cut it off at that point. We'll come back here now. Uh, maybe you can hear this. I'm cutting through some Y bones right here, but not through the ribs. And I'll take the meat right over the top of the ribs, like that, and down through the belly. I'm doing this kind of quickly. This is how you have to do it when you catch a big limit of fish this size. Of course, you do that all the time, don't you, Stan? Okay, there's your fillet, like that. And I leave it right attached to the skin there on the tail and pull it right off. Now, some people are concerned about the, the fat, the PCBs, the DDT, and that type of thing. But as long as you fillet a fish this way, take the skin off and cut the fat off, you really aren't going to have any problem. And there it is. There it is, a nice fillet. You think you might like to eat that fillet of steelhead? It's looking better, isn't it? It certainly <laughs> is. I'll tell you, broil that up and it'll be great. Well, Stan, now let's go to uh, another aspect of fishing. You work for the Michigan Travel Bureau. You know about fishing all over the state, and we've had some really great fish in the state. Let's go to our trophy report right now of fish that have been caught by Michigan anglers. Any largemouth bass over six pounds qualifies for a Master Angler Award from the DNR. Jim Dokter from Holland was fishing last May at 7.30 in the morning, casting a beetle spin. That's a little plastic grub with a spinner blade. And he became a Master Angler by landing this six pound, 14 ounce Lunker Big Mouth. Hess Lake in Nuego County was his hot spot. Here's a channel catfish caught by Brian Howell of Royal Oak. East Twin Lake in Montmorency County was his fishing hole one afternoon in June. It bit on a night crawler. Now you can tell this is not a bullhead catfish, not only by the size, a wee bit over nine pounds, but the tail on a channel cat is forked. Bullheads are rounded. A 19 and a half pound lake trout is a real catch, especially from an inland lake. Walloon Lake near Charlevoix is where Tom Andrews of Saginaw caught this butte, trolling with a manistee wobbler. Lake trout lay on the bottom, right on the bottom, and they aren't spectacular fighters at all. Good eating, but if you want a fighting fish, go for an Atlantic salmon. Ron Short from Detroit probably saw a few aerial acrobatics from this 20 and a half pounder. Off Ludington is where this and most of Michigan's Atlantic salmon were caught this summer. 
most northern pike over 20 pounds come from the UP. This 20 pound 13 ouncer is no exception. Ike Owens from Monroe was fishing at the mouth of the Fanny Ho River at Copper Harbor. His five inch chub attracted 41 inches of northern pike. Pike are popular game fish in Michigan, but pike have a big cousin that some anglers become infatuated with catching. It's the Great Lakes Muscalonge or muskie. They not only fight like crazy, but they grow much larger than pike. Carrie Gentry from East Detroit was trolling a red and white spoon in Michigan's prime muskie waters, Lake St. Clair. He had to be thrilled with his catch, a 51-inch muskie that topped the scales at 33 and a half pounds. For size and length, Carrie Gentry caught our Michigan Outdoors Trophy of the Week. Well, after seeing those trophies, Stan, a lot of guys are going to want to get out, and gals too, and try fishing, maybe some ice fishing. You've told us how to do it. How about where to do it this weekend? Any suggestions? Right now, it's important to go to the safe place. Oh, no, that's for sure. The shallow lakes are the ones freezing over the earliest, and I would recommend Houghton Lake. Houghton Lake? That already has uh, shanties on it, and oh, uh, there's good fishing there. Of course, you can catch walleye, bluegill, pike. Or just about everything there. It's what about southern Michigan anglers down here in Detroit area? Well, people there I would lake. recommend Kent Lake up at Kensington Park. Excellent mm -hmm. lake for uh, crappie and bluegill. Okay, and what about Saginaw Bay people who like to catch those jumbo perch? Is there any fishing there yet? The Saginaw Bay edges freeze over, and believe it or not, you get the jumbo perch in three feet of water. That should be developing any day now. Okay, now what's the tip for early ice fishing? I think the biggest tip for ice fishermen really is go light on monofilament. Get used to two and four pound test monofilament and you're going to do better. This is the man who knows. And Stan, I hope you're going to join us January 30th. You know what that is? No, I'm... Okay, I'll spring it on you. It's our Sportsman's Banquet. Michigan United Conservation Clubs and Michigan Outdoors is sponsoring a Sportsman's Recognition Banquet. Big buck contest winners, Master Angler Awards, and you, Stan Liebensee, will be there, right? Well, thank you. I certainly will. Okay. I'm invited. Great. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week right here on Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history of copper mines and iron ore, the Great Lakes fisheries. To the farmlands of the southern counties, we'll look around again, and all that waits the sportsman in the state of Michigan. And sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow, and the stillness of the forest lies encased in Arctic cold, the wind might whisper through the trees, listen if you can, it tells you of the beauty in the state of Michigan. Hi there, I'm Fred Trost, inviting you to join me this Thursday night on Michigan Outdoors. We have a special Christmas Eve show. You're going to learn about an animal that lives in Michigan. It's called a fisher, but it doesn't eat fish. It eats porcupines, of all things. Wildlife photographer Tom Sterling has some footage of that. And we're going to have 11-year-old Brian Regan, who caught a 25-pound muskie on a bear hook. Hear how he does it this Thursday night right here on Michigan Outdoors.